Howdy folks, Jabriki here. Guess what? I've reached 2,000 subscribers. How awesome is that? A big thanks to everyone that subscribed to my channel. You play a huge part in my channel's growth. I'm really grateful. To celebrate reaching 2,000 subs, I'm going to be reviewing both of the Kung Fu Panda movies back to back. Yes, beginning with Kung Fu Panda 1. Kung Fu Panda is an animated martial arts comedy drama. It follows Poe the Panda, a clumsy noodle bar waiter who's obsessed with Kung Fu and idolizes the Furious Five, a team of Kung Fu masters. One day it's announced that the role of the Dragon Warrior is going to be handed out to one of the members of the Furious Five, and folks can come see the announcement live. So Poe eagerly tries to attend the event, only to accidentally end up being picked as the Dragon Warrior. Suddenly, Poe's life has changed as he's forced to live up to the Dragon Warrior name and train as hard as he can. However, there's tension between the Furious Five, their teacher Master Shifu, and Poe, because they don't believe that he is the rightful Dragon Warrior. To make matters worse, the evil martial artist Tai Long has escaped from prison and wants to claim his position as the Dragon Warrior. Can Shifu train Poe to become the ultimate Kung Fu master and save China from Tai Long? Kung Fu Panda is a great example of DreamWorks animation finding their groove and embracing it. It's a film that has fun with itself while also telling an intelligent dramatic story. It smoothly blends its comedy and drama, it balances these tones superbly. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but it also doesn't go overboard with its comedy. In fact, the comedy and drama take advantage of each other. The humour is used to dissect the insecurities of its characters, and the drama is used to help jokes work by creating a believable world for the gags to work in. Poe makes for a fantastic protagonist. He's a joyful and upbeat fanboy. It's his nerdy passion for Kung Fu that makes him so sweet, relatable and lovable. I often passionately obsess over certain things and get nervously excited when meeting my heroes, so I completely resonated with Poe's character. Jack Black's over-energetic voice is ideal for Poe too. It's like he was born to play this role. He sounds believably enthusiastic, but at the same time, he's fully capable of switching to dramatic mode. Oh, the Sacred Hall of Warriors! No way! Look at this place. <gasps> Master Flying Rhino's armor with authentic battle damage! Whoa! The Sword of Heroes! Said to be so sharp you can cut yourself just by looking at Ow! it. I mean, I'm not like the Five. I've got no claws, no wings, no venom. Even Mantis has those... Thingies. Ah, <sighs> maybe I should just quit and go back to making noodles. Also, Poe may be the chosen one, but the film doesn't hand things to him on a plate. He has to work hard and prove that he deserves the position of the Dragon Warrior. Usually, the chosen one trope is inherently amazing or doesn't even have to do anything to prove him or herself. Poe is challenged, pushed and humiliated, physically and spiritually. There's no deus ex machina or automatic praise from everyone around him. Although, the film isn't just about Poe's rise from noodle bar waiter to kung fu warrior, it's also about Shifu's struggle to believe in his own teaching abilities. Kung Fu Panda turns the wise old master trope into a humanized and dimensional character with a relatable flaw, a lack of self-confidence. Shifu is far from perfect. Unlike his master, he has a very short temper. He's been presented with the challenge of turning a clumsy, heavy-set panda into a prized martial arts student. It's not a simple task, but Shifu must push his teaching skills and broaden his mind to achieve his goal. The relationship between Poe and Shifu is incredibly poignant. They have to push each other and bring out each other's self-confidence. I also love how Poe never loses his character as he trains with Shifu. He doesn't suddenly become serious, he still retains his goofy charm. Heck, the training method involves Shifu using Poe's love of food to his advantage, which leads to some unique and funny exercises, which are cleverly utilized in the film's finale, which gives the training some weight and importance. It's not just the training that's solid. The fight scenes are also super impressive. The choreography for every fight is full of active intensity and realistic motion. These martial arts sequences are shot brilliantly too. The filmmakers use the camera to capture the energy of the fights and show as much detail as possible to illustrate the skills of each fighter. Each character has their own fighting style too, depending on their personality and animal design, which makes for some unique action. Now, I will admit that the film's villain, Tai Lung, isn't very interesting. 
I could see what the writers intended to do with him. They wanted him to be a cold, calculated and sophisticated bad guy. The problem is that the film doesn't really do much with these traits and focuses more on his desperation to become the Dragon Warrior. I will admit that he's not a very memorable villain because of this. However, the film does an amazing job presenting Tai Lung. When we first meet him, he's locked away securely and surrounded by thousands of guards. He has his head down, he's thinking, plotting and scheming. This shows the magnitude of his threat. This guy is dangerous and confident. That is scary. Tai Long also plays a big part in Shifu's character arc. Tai Long was raised and taught Kung Fu by Shifu, so there's a strong emotional relation between both characters, which not only adds tension to the narrative, but also adds depth to Shifu's lack of self-confidence. Shifu identifies Tai Long as one of his failures and lets this guilt him into thinking that he's not a skilled enough teacher. It's like Tai Long represents Shifu's self-doubt, which is pretty deep storytelling. The aspect that supports this film's intelligent poignancy and clever comedy has to be its visuals. This is a really colourful movie. It uses a wide colour palette to create some dazzling, vibrant imagery. The film also uses colour to indicate moods and tones. Red means power, green means knowledge, blue means evil or negativity, yellow means happiness, pink means beauty. The film's comedy is also elevated by the visuals. The animation for the slapstick and pratfalls is directed with a keen sense of timing, pacing and response. The on-screen jokes work because there's some precision and planning into each gag. It's like watching a Tex Avery or Chuck Jones cartoon, it's that well executed. At the same time, the cartoony designs are also utilised in the drama's favour. The characters' bold, expressive faces are used to convey strong emotions, like sadness, confusion or deep thought. Like I said, the comedic elements of the film are taken advantage of to strengthen the film's drama. In addition, one of the most notable parts of the film's visuals is how it utilises 2D animation in a 3D film. Poe's dreams are visualised through a striking anime art style. It's a clever way of dividing reality and fantasy because it helps to illustrate a sense of exaggeration. Plus, it takes things back to the studio's roots in 2D animation. To conclude, Kung Fu Panda is an amazing film to me. It proves that animated family films can have a good balance of dramatic integrity and a sense of humour. It took a silly idea, embraced it, and expanded it into intelligent cinematic brilliance. It has to be one of my favourite DreamWorks animated movies. So, could DreamWorks make a good Kung Fu Panda sequel? Well, let's find out as I discuss Kung Fu Panda 2. Kung Fu Panda 2 follows Poe and the Furious Five as they go on a quest to stop the evil peacock Shen, who has created a cannon to defeat legendary martial artists and take over China. You see, Shen's family fortune teller prophesies that a panda will one day defeat him if he goes down a dark path. In fear, Shen slaughtered all the pandas of China and doesn't know that Poe is still alive. As Poe takes on Shen and his army, memories of his past start flooding back and interrupt his focus. Can Poe discover his origins through Shen and stop him from dominating China? Instead of treading the same ground as the first film, Kung Fu Panda 2 expands on its predecessor and creates a sequel that feels justified. It stays faithful to the tone, style and world of the first film while also coming up with new exciting ideas. To begin with, Poe hasn't lost his nerdy charm or clumsiness since the first film. Despite now being a renowned martial artist, he still gushes over kung fu legends, has a plump body, keeps making pratfalls and continues to act like a dork. We still believe that he's a skilled fighter because of what he's capable of, but the film knows that the joke of a kung fu panda can't work without Poe's awkward nature and cuddly physique. The film also dives into Poe's relationship with his adoptive father Mr. Ping and memories of his biological parents. We've grown to love Mr. Ping because he's so sweet, caring and immensely proud of his son. So it's heartbreaking seeing Poe doubt his relationship with his adoptive dad because we know how much Mr. Ping adores Poe. However, this doesn't make Poe come across as mean or spiteful, far from it. Poe is going through some major confusion and is having to accept new facts. He means well and does love Mr. Ping deep down, but a lot is going through his head. The film expands on Poe's character as he now starts questioning his identity and heritage, which adds dimension and humanity to his character. He's more than just a clumsy goofball, he's a sentient creature with thoughts, feelings and concerns. The fact that the story's villain triggers these memories is solid writing on the film's part. There's an emotional connection between our protagonist and antagonist that goes far back. This makes their fights personal and leads to some very emotional interactions. 
Speaking of the villain, talk about a bad guy. Sure, Shen may have the cliche motive of domination, but there's some soul and meat behind his character, which helps prevent him from being a cookie cutter cartoon antagonist. He's a very entertaining and theatrical villain, but his showmanship is obviously a cover up for his insecurities and fears. He's a fully dimensional antagonist because of this. He has personal issues and discretions that drive him to want to take over China. He's so afraid of being defeated by anyone at all that he sees entire domination of his surroundings as a comfort blanket. He reminds me of the villain from How to Train Your Dragon 2. At the same time, Shen does pose as a threat to our heroes. He not only leads a huge army of wolves, he also has a technological weapon that may defeat Poe's greatest passion and strongest skill. Shen is also a decent fighter and geniusly hides spears in his wings, which neatly camouflage in his feathers. Shen is a legitimate danger, plus he has a memorable striking design, depth to his motives, a theatrical personality, and a personal relationship with our hero. This is how you write a bad guy. These are the ingredients for a memorable villain that audiences can get engaged with. Audiences can also get plenty of thrills from the action scenes, which are even more imaginative and exciting than the one showcased in the first film. There's so many energetic and creative martial arts sequences in the film. Some are wacky and comedic, others are jaw-dropping in scope, and some are actually kind of tranquil. You see, a central part of Poe's character arc in this film is his task of finding inner peace, to the point where he can handle a water drop with fluid ease, which is hard for him to do when his mind is being aggravated by confusion over his origins. I love that the film addresses the more passive and spiritual side of Kung Fu, showing that it's more than just badass fighting. Now, in the first film, the Furious Five mainly served as straight characters to play off Poe's antics, but this sequel lets them all shine. Poe has certainly left an effect on the Five and inspired them to be themselves more, so they get to make more jokes, play about, bounce off each other, and still provide some kick-ass moves. Tigress in particular gets some incredible development. We learn that there's a soft side to her, hidden underneath a tough exterior. The way the film handles Tigress's sensitive side is addressed in a quiet, subtle way. There's no melodramatic fuss. It's all told through little indications and subdued character animation. It's amazing seeing this level of visual communication in a family film. Finally, let's discuss the visuals. This sequel is jaw-dropping to look at, and much like the first film, the colours are awe-inspiring. It has a broad and striking colour palette. It's brilliant. The character animation ranges from Tex Avery style slapstick to heart-wrenching drama. Every performance on screen fits the tone of the scene without ruining the balance of wacky comedy and serious tragedy. Much like the first film, this sequel utilises 2D animation. This time it's used to depict Poe's memories, which is perfect because it shows how memories can seem familiar yet a little blurry. The different animation style certainly helps to create this distinction. In addition, Shen's backstory is visualised through beautiful cutout animation. I would love to see DreamWorks do a whole movie in this style because it's so pretty and charming. To conclude, Kung Fu Panda 2 is one of the finest sequels I've ever seen. It expands on the first film and takes the franchise in a unique spiritual direction. It's funny, exciting and tied together with solid drama. So those are my thoughts on Kung Fu Panda 1 and 2. I hope you enjoyed my reviews and you know what? I'm really excited about Kung Fu Panda 3. I can't wait for it. I'm so, so hyped up. <laughs> Cheerio folks. Oh, <laughs>